The Twins stand pat and lose. Plus, the Dragon football season is right around the corner. Head coach Steve Lockway in studio with us to preview 2024. Let's roll on Hot Mike. Hot Mike with Dom Izzo. Really? Really, Dom? No. I like what Dom's doing. Okay. Dom Izzo. Jeez. Come on, Dom. What do you think I am, a magician? Yeah, I'm fired up, Dom. What else could I say? Absolutely. I was great to get on the field, and then Dom came up to me, and I'm trying to walk away from me. I just wanted to enjoy myself out there. Hot Mike. Great job. <laughs> There's got to be some kind of intelligent question about something. Is a coach Dom Izzo, WDAY in Fargo, North Dakota. Can you give me a layup or something? Hot Mike. Hot Mike. That program is second to none. On the networks of WDAY. You know, if it's not about sports, I find it very hard to concentrate. Here's Dom Izzo. Dom Izzo. Good Wednesday morning. Welcome to the You Bet We're Good at Rugby edition of Hot Mike on WDAY Extra, KSFL TV in Sioux Falls and in Forum.com. 31st day of July, final day of the month. We're wrapping things up in style and ready to head into the final month of summer. I've already called it with August uh, on tap as we say goodbye to July in the quote unquote slowest month of the year. For the sports people that are out there and ready to start uh, into August. We got to change that music again, Eric. That, that threw me off there. <laughs> on, the, on the fade out. Anyway, uh, just on air producing as we do. Welcome to the show, everybody, on this Wednesday morning. Bison Media Zone back in studio today to launch into the football season. The Bison will hold their third practice later today. We'll be out there uh, this afternoon visiting with some players as well. Anticipation of our big show tomorrow, Bison Media Zone. Uh, expanded edition tomorrow as Hot Mike will be live out at Bison Media Day, uh, which is tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we'll be visiting with coaches, players. All of it will be live. You can see it on WDAY Plus, Inforum.com. You'll see part of the press conferences with head coach Tim Polisek, offensive coordinator Jake Landry, defensive coordinator Grant Olson. That will all be on WDAY Extra. We'll give you that uh, details coming up uh, later on in today's show, previewing what we got coming up uh, tomorrow on the program. we got a lot to get to today. The trade deadline is come and gone in Major League Baseball, and everybody made a trade. The Twins decidedly made a trade as well that uh, is about as underwhelming as can be thought of. And of all the other angst and complaints we've had about the baseball team this season, whether it was inconsistency to start the year or the fact that their games have not been available on television for three months, and then they're contending for a potential division crown, then you see what their biggest competitors either did or didn't do. The Guardians didn't make any earth-shattering moves. The Royals made a slight move. That's what probably makes... What happened yesterday with uh, the inactivity of the Twins at the deadline probably hurt even more. And consider the fact they're not that far removed from having one of the top records in baseball. There's no one running away with things. Certainly not in the, uh, in the American League. It's not happening. Heck, in the National League, the Phillies have established themselves as the best team there. And the Twins just took two of three from Philly. That's the part where if you're sitting there this morning and you're already blacked out and can't watch the games, then nothing happens. I can imagine the frustration level has to be uh, high on this Wednesday morning. And add in the fact they still have yet to beat a team from New York this year. They were 0-6 against the Yankees, and now they're 0-2 against the New York Metropolitans. Apparently, whatever ailed the Mets was bringing the Twins, and they've gotten healthy because yesterday uh, the Mets pitching, which been okay, was tremendous for the second game in a row. They got off to a quick start on this J.D. Martinez single to score Brandon Nimmo off David Festo, who got the start yesterday, who pitched well again. This was his only real mistake. Mark Vientos, who's been a godsend for the Mets offense, blast that one to left field, nearly 400 feet to give the Mets a 2-0 lead. That was his 15th home run. Vientos came up last year, got sent down to Syracuse in the minors. He's been back up and been tremendous. Sean Manaya 
former Oakland A, former Indiana State Sycamore, that the Mets picked up was brilliant. 11 strikeouts last night in seven innings, allowed two hits and one walk, and by far his best start of the season. Edwin Diaz came in with the trumpets, that the final out of the ball game, as the Minnesota Twins mustered all of two hits last night. The Mets win again, 2 nothing. The final at City Field last night. Manaya now seven and four on the year. Festa is the hard luck loser. He pitched well, five innings, three hits, two runs, and six strikeouts. He's done enough, I think, to earn another couple of cracks at this. If the Twins so far and decide that, uh, he drops to one and two on the season. The lone two hits in the game: Santana and Brooks Lee, who finally got off the Schneid with a hit. Uh, for the Twins last night. The Guardians are turning it on again. Cleveland's won three in a row. So the Twins are now six and a half back with Kansas City, also six and a half back on this Wednesday morning. The White Sox, by the way, have lost 16 games in a row. Chicago lost again yesterday. The White Sox are 27 and 83. They are coming to Target Field this weekend. And the Twins, I think, have won 9 of 10 against Chicago so far. They'll uh, they'll look to that series to try and get healthy uh, heading into the weekend. The up-to-date standings, as you saw in the Central and the wild card race, there the Twins and Royals are now tied. The Twins have a game up in the loss column on Kansas City with Boston losing yesterday. So the Red Sox dropped a full game behind both the Royals and the Twins, they're two games back of Minnesota in the loss column uh, is, the, uh, is the Red Sox at two games back. Then the Astros and the Rays, each at three and a half back for the American League wild card race sitting here on this Wednesday morning. Final game of the series comes up. It's a noon start at City Field today. Pablo Lopez will try and get his 10th win of the season. Nine and seven with an ERA just uh, under 4.75. Luis Severino, former Yankee great, who was talking smack uh, to the Yankees last week and backed it up. He's had a nice year for the for the Mets, 7-3 and three with a 3.58 earn run average. That'll be the matchup today. Just a quick sidebar here. No one in most predictions had the Mets doing anything this year, all right? I said they would make the playoffs. I said that on March, whatever, 27th when the season began, that just being my blind love of this team. But Consider they're paying so many salaries of other teams, players, Verlander, Scherzer, Mark Canna. They're playing. They're paying tons of guys who aren't playing. James McCann, I think they're still paying, who plays for the Orioles, who got hit in the face the other night. And they are seven games over 500. I get it. They, they had, their owner is the richest owner in sports and is going to pay whatever. But consider that they have completely overachieved. I'll brag about this as we get to August 1 here. They're a half game back of Atlanta for a second. The Mets at Memorial Day were 11 games under 500. They have been red hot. Now seven games over 500 in position in the wild card race. Let's go. Next two months are going to be fun. It's always when you're a baseball fan and your team is in contention, not losers of 16 in a row, it's also... Uh, makes for a heck of a lot more fun. That's what makes what the Twins didn't do yesterday so infuriating. They did make a move. The only guy who knows who Trevor Richards is is probably Eric Fidel because he played for the Brewers. I don't know if anybody else knows who he is, but that's who the Twins traded for yesterday. Oh, <laughs> Eric doesn't know. He did. He pitched for the Brewers. He pitched for the Blue Jays, and that's who uh, the Twins acquired Yesterday, uh, in a trade with Toronto, Richards is 31 years old, mark of 2-1 and one with a 4.64 earn run average this season. He's also pitched in the major leagues for Miami, Tampa, and Milwaukee in 280 big league games. He started 61 of them as well, an ERA of 4.5, 598 strikeouts, in 547 innings, which also makes this, uh, you have to 
shake your head at it. He's in the final year of his contract, so the Twins aren't going to have to pay him much. They sent minor league infielder Jay Harry to the Jays. Uh, Harry's a six-round pick uh, out of last year's draft. who's hitting 214 with eight home runs at Class A Cedar Rapids. Josh Stama was uh, DFA'd. He was released. The other big news yesterday was the reactivation of Randy Dobnak. Now, Dobnak has not pitched in the major leagues in three years. He suffered a rupture of the tiny ligaments in his right middle finger called pulleys. I've never heard of this before, which caused intense pain whenever he squeezed a baseball to throw the sinker, which was Dobnak's signature out pitch. Uh, It healed, but then it got worse in 2022. Uh, His finger is permanently damaged on that, so he can't throw it. He's remade himself, according to the Star Tribune, as a slider changeup pitcher with a four-seam fastball mixed in. You'll remember Dobnak in the uh, the Bomba squad year of 2019 came up, and he was one of the sensational stories of that twin season. Uber driver who came out of nowhere, and he be- he started a game for the Twins in the postseason. That became the poster child of why the Twins needed to upgrade pitching. Because that year, in 2019, when the Twins hit 500 home runs, they had Randy Dobnak starting game two, I think it was, against the Yankees that year, and uh, inevitably was another sweep from New York. Now, I guess, are they telling to tell us that he's going to be the the magic here for the Twins, and that's why they didn't need to go add a guy? I find that hard to, to stomach. That, to me, is... A slap in the face. It honestly is. The Dodgers went and got Jack Flaherty from the Tiger. I mean, you just look at everybody went. The teams that were thinking, we're in it to win it. We're going to go and be aggressive. The Dodgers obviously believe they can. They added six guys. Six. I'm looking at ESPN graded here yesterday, the biggest winners and losers. Uh, Dodgers, they had the biggest winner. Atlanta is the biggest loser. I'm okay with that, considering the Mets are trying to chase them down. Other winners, they have the Diamondbacks, the Orioles, Reds. uh, Royals are there. Uh, The Mets are on there, which is okay. And frankly, uh, here we go. This is what ESPN wrote about the Twins' lack of action. The Twins have been tight with their money since the winter. With television-related revenue, uncertainty a culprit. They can't always cling to that. They still got $50 million in that deal. But the fans of the Twin Cities are fantastic, and, with, and, and they treat them horribly. And with Minnesota in excellent playoff position, they deserve a team more willing to set aside short-sighted economic anxieties. Amen. Uh, we're always irked by teams that don't seize right now opportunities. Minnesota did pick up reliever Trevor Richards very late in the trade window. That basically deserves a shrug emoji. Yeah, that, that's perfectly said. Uh, just, it's already bad enough that you've given a middle finger to fans by not being on television for three months. Then you have a team that is contending. If I'm Carlos Correa right now, and I know he's hurt, but Correa has got to be like, what are we doing? What are we doing? We have everything in place. You've got your stud in Royce Lewis. Buxton's had a nice year. You've got Jose Moran. You've got pieces there, and you're not that far out of this in the division race. And your move is for a middle-inning, late-inning setup guy. That just, it's so uninteresting. If you... You want people to go ahead and flock to the Vikings, go for it. Just wave the white flag and say, we're all set. Remember they did that, I think it was 2017, when they traded Brian Dozier. And then what happened? The team got red hot and made the wild card that year. It's just that the fans deserve more than this. And I'm I'm with you. If you're upset this morning, you got every right to be because you did bupkis uh, at the deadline there we got plenty to get to today. It's a busy Wednesday spectacular on on tap for us. Drew Trafton will be joining us in just a few minutes. Lots to recap from the Olympics uh, and from our Nerd Central as well. We'll talk with Drew about that coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, At 935, in studio, this has become a yearly tradition that the head football coach at Minnesota State University, Moorhead, Steve Lockway, will join us. 
uh, to chat about the upcoming football season. Of course, Steve is a guest of ours each and every Tuesday throughout uh, the year. We've done this forever. We'll look ahead to 2024. Big expectations for the Dragons after winning seven games last year. Uh, potential playoff expectations for MSUM. We'll visit about that and a bunch of other topics. It's always good to talk uh, with Coach Lockway, which we'll do uh, coming up today at 935. It is Bison Media Zone Wednesday. Our studio is set back up. Mike McFeely will join me this morning. Give us a first overview of fall camp, some storylines we're going to be watching, and a couple other Bison-related topics we'll hit on as well coming up at 1035. So looking forward to that. So let's roll. Hot Mike is off and rolling here on this Wednesday morning. Back after this on WDAY Extra, KSFL-TV, and Inforum.com. The biggest Seahawks, Sounders, and Mariners fan in the FM area. It's time for Views with Drew. It is Wednesday at 920. Our guy Drew Trapton joining us remotely today. From the, This is the uh, the new offices here. These are, this is swanky, yes. man. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't, like, I, I can show you. I've got, Go like, a really it. cool view outside the. Uh, yeah. You got windows, floor, man. You got, you got yeah, windows. Yeah, i got windows. <laughs> yeah, we had a. Our, our boss in the newsroom used to joke because after we've se- since remodeled. Yes. Remodeled, I guess, it was what? It was like eight years ago. God, yeah, you're and right. It's probably that, eight, nine years ago. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah. That moved the newsroom. Yep. It used to be in the basement. Where, where, I'm, where, I'm, studios, where, I'm, where you are. Where I'm right now. Literally yep. where you yes. are right now. Yes. That's where the newsroom was. <laughs> and it was has since obviously been remodeled. And the second floor was also remodeled. And it was really beautiful newsroom space. I mean, I've worked in a couple of different news markets and, and by far WDOY has the nicest newsroom. I mean, I, we know people who work in like the twin cities market and they'll come back and they'll be like, wow, this newsroom is so nice compared to what we have. <laughs> and, um, and it has windows yep. like it's on, cause it's on the second story. And a lot of newsrooms are built into like these old garage spaces or just like, you know, it's just converted buildings. And so there are no windows at all. So you got swanky the there. Is, no, wait, I don't want to get you in trouble. Is that anything behind you that you shouldn't be revealing on the computer screen behind you there? No, actually. So I just put this morning in the last couple of hours, the very finishing touches. I, I received three pieces of video that I was waiting on um, that are converted 16 millimeter films uh, from from Moorhead. Um, and this is for the inaugural episode of a sports series that I, we're going to launch in the next couple of weeks once the prep season gets going. Um, and it's just this beautiful video. You, you wouldn't believe it. It's, it's in this uh, colored film, 60 millimeter film. This is a 1960. This is the 1960 state track meet. Wow. In Minnesota. <laughs> uh, and some of this game film that Moore had discovered, they were going through the, the Moorhead area, the Legacy Foundation there, that was working on this book for, you know, celebrating 150 yep. years of district history. And they stumbled on this, the, the one of the guys who's, who's in charge of it, Brian Cole, yep. Cole over at Moorhead um, Horizon Middle School, uh, was in the football coach's office over there. And the, the coach was like, hey, I think this closet we have has, has, game film and he opened it up and they have like 500 600 canisters of 16 millimeter film <laughs> going back to 1949 wow and yeah and so th- that's uh that's the inspiration for an, an inaugural episode of the sports series that i'm working on called glory days and uh i just i just finished editing the first episode all right and uh yeah so That'll be up on our app here in a, in a, a, a couple weeks at most. Yep. Um, but if, if anybody out there has a story of a high school team that you were on that you really want to get some attention on, you don't have to win state or anything like that. Just a really cool team. You have pictures, video from, from then, in, anything. I mean, it doesn't have to be an older team. It can be from three, four years ago, whatever. Uh, I'd love to tell that story. Awesome. Awesome. Can't, yeah. That would be fantastic. I saw a few clips of that as well uh, from Brian, and it's amazingly yeah. well kept for how old it is. It looks really cool. And I am imploring yeah. the spuds to go back to the orange pants and orange jerseys and orange helmet today. Make it happen today. Those are fantastic. Yeah, I've got a couple of clips in this in this episode of, uh, I think, 1970. I can't remember which year 
they're playing Shanley. Yeah. And they're wearing, yeah, the, the orange pants and the orange fantastic. helmet. It's a pretty sharp look. So it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, are, have you been roped into Olympic fever? I know you had a oh, fever, so but do you have Olympic fever? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I was sick over the weekend and unfortunately, and, um, but that, that allowed for me to, you know, watch a lot of, there Olympics. You go. And boy, boy, did we, what did you we, watch? And we, we, we also taped, um, a lot of gymnastics, Okay. Yep. The, the men's, the men's gymnastics. We watched, um, I watched a lot of archery, Ooh. which I don't normally watch. Okay. Yep. Um, I've, I've watched uh, handball. I've Handball's watched outstanding. Water polo. Yep. Uh, the women's rugby tournament was so much fun to watch. And I watched that. That was probably my favorite thing that I've watched. Um, you got to look just, at my, you got to look at the rundown. Cause I was going to ask you about the USA women's rugby final yesterday in the, they won the bronze in the most ridiculous way possible. That was all the uh, Iron Bowl. Well, I can't remember what year that was when the yes. guy returned the, yeah. the, the miss field The missed goal. field goal, yes. Oh, my gosh, that was intense. Seven seconds on the clock. And and she just broke. That was that was cool. That makes me want to really start watching rugby more often. I know that's sevens, which is a different, Correct. kind of a different iteration of the game, but... Uh, man, oh man, that was really fun to watch. We're watching it now. They won it literally. They had the try. I mean, they beat the Australians, and you know there's like a certain... 94 yeah. meter sprint with no time just... left. Apparently, they have uh, yeah. stoppage time in rugby as well. I didn't know that. Um, I thought they just have it in uh, in soccer, but they have it in uh, rugby as well. They're going to be next to the gymnast, like one of the stars of the games. They will be. They're going to be all over TV the next couple weeks, and they should be. be. Has to be. And yeah. Alona Marr, yes. their, you know, kind of their most popular player. The has stiff built arm of stiff arms. Following on Instagram of, of like more than a million followers. Yeah. And it's captivating to watch. And this game's, I really feel like, and I don't know if it's because of the NIL factor with the college athletes, you know, that, that who have really figured it out, but there seems to be that, that social media attachment to these athletes where, I mean, they, they're really. Yeah capitalizing on on that exposure and, and making it really work for them and it's, it's kind of fun to see ratings are crazy which is not surprising but i will say and i, I tweeted this out last night nbc's olympic prime time they finally figured out they've edited it together you get to see the best uh moments of the day it's quick and you don't they they don't dawdle on stuff i like that i don't know why it took so long to figure out but they've got it now where it's a neat three-hour package here's everything you want to see from swimming here's the big moments from gymnastics oh we're going to sprinkle in the other like that's the perfect way to when you can't have it live in prime time that's the best way to do it Mm -hmm. yeah and i think probably part of that equation for them uh and i think you know abc sports has gone through this too uh you know and and so have a lot of different uh you know broadcasters but the, the amount of control that you have over right. live sporting events and what that means, especially when it's taking place, you know, six hours, seven hours ahead, like we see with the World Cup. Yep. Uh, you know, you lose a lot of that control in the age of the Internet where there, you could constantly be spoiled on social media. And, you know, you really have to, to remove yourself from what's going on in the world to avoid seeing <laughs> a lot of those results. Where back in the day, you know, like, you know, when the Miracle on Ice happened, you know, I mean, you had to avoid your local yeah. news and that was it. Right. You know, and so, so that, you know, it, it that has really changed, uh, you know, and, and I think they are figuring that out now and you know, technology never slows down for us. You know, we have to, we have yep. to adapt to it. And I think those, I think you're right. I think this is the Olympics where they're really getting it. Um, and, and maybe part of that had to do with the fact that Tokyo was, you know, in, in the, part of covid yeah and so there was so much more to adapt to anyway but they've i i think they've really figured out the secret sauce this time around and the 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 app they had last time with tokyo i thought was really good and they've they figured that part of it out yep but now you know having having that mixture of what's live what can we you know really hammer right now and then so many of our you know viewing platforms allow you to record things yep and that that helps too right Okay, so Saturday night, about nine o'clock, I texted you because I'm freaking out as I'm on my phone. My my didn't want to wake my wife up; who would fall asleep, and my son certainly. 
uh, with the news out of San Diego uh, with the annual comic convention, Comic-Con, which has become the biggest thing for, I mean, it's movie stars go there. It's not just for nerds yeah. like Drew and yeah. I. And Marvel had its presentation, and Marvel hasn't been there in a couple years. And we figured there was going to be some newsy stuff. There was with uh, with uh, Anthony Mackie and Harrison Ford in the new Captain America movie, which we're excited about. The Thunderbolts, which is a cool one coming. Uh, and then they announced that the Russo brothers are coming back to do the next two events, which is great because they did the last two Avengers movies, which were the biggest mm-hmm. movies ever. They made $2 billion. And then they decide to announce who the villain is going to be. And <laughs> and I'm still wrapping my mind around it that Robbie, Robert Downey Jr. is back as Victor Von Doom. Uh, we're playing the video here from when they announced it on Saturday. I freaked out. I showed it to my son, who's five, and he said, Dad, isn't that Iron Man? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. What are we doing here? Are they out of ideas, or is this a cool idea? I, I think it's maybe a bit of both. Okay. You know, I, I, I was really surprised when you texted me. I was not you know, on, on social media at all, and that was, that was like, right? It, it took me a few minutes yeah. to, to like calibrate, okay, what's happening? Where are we? What's going on? And then I got to thinking after we had we had texted back and forth a bit, like, why are they doing this? Right. And to me, it's it's really evident that the MCU is and, and this is joked about consistently through Deadpool and Wolverine, <laughs> which which we both saw yep. la- last week, that the MCU is at a low point. Yep. You know, that Marvel, the Marvel Cinematic Universe needs something. And to me, this is the ultimate Hail Mary, right? Because not only is it Doctor Doom. <laughs> arguably the greatest villain that Marvel has Correct. To pull out, which they haven't yet. That, that seems like a, you know, kind of shattered glass in case of emergency, but they're bringing <laughs> back now their most bankable star yeah, in that to do it. Right. To do it. And so that's like, it's almost like a double plus the Russo brothers. So it's almost like yep. a three tiered, like last case, like, or like worst case scenario, pull this lever and you can resurrect <laughs> the whole thing. It kind of seems like that's what they're doing yep. here. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily like reek of desperation just because there's so much excitement around it, but it, it makes me think like, Oh, they, they really yeah. need a hard reboot Correct. reboot. And this is the, like the most direct way they can do it. And the most, the, the way they know they absolutely are certain they're going to be able to put people in the seats at movie theaters for this. And they're right. And so it's like, okay, yeah, yep. they will. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yep. There's no doubt in my mind that this will, at the worst, be a $1.5 billion <laughs> film. You know, <laughs> Avengers Doomsday or however they're titling it. You know, And here's and so, the... Th- so they're like, this will get us back. Here's the... Th- uh, Downey's getting... In Variety Report, he's getting paid $80 million, I think, for each of them, which is, I mean... He's red hot right now anyway because he won the Academy yeah. Award, and he's awesome in Oppenheimer. I can't recommend that strongly enough there. But you're – So I, good. The, so good. He, my it's last point in this, stress. and we, we got to roll, like he, the excitement of this announcement will wear off, and then that's what I'm intrigued mm-hmm. about. Okay, so what are they doing? That's where I'm curious about about bringing him back, well, you know? And, and I think they, they fall back right into the trap if – people are more enamored with the villain than the hero. Yeah. And I think a villain will bring people to the theater, but if you want this Avengers, this this version of the Avengers to have staying power, people have to be invested in the heroes, and you need somebody who's a foil to Downey Jr. Is that going to be Pedro Pascal's Mr. Fantastic? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, We haven't seen yeah. him on, on film yet, but I don't know if they have that character. I think they were hoping that maybe Paul Rudd could could be yeah. the anchor to that maybe you know so you know you know maybe going back they're hoping that Chadwick Boseman would have been right which yep. he totally could have been used to yep. do that no doubt but I don't think they have that hero right now who's been at least on screen yet unless they really want it to be Ryan Reynolds or Hugh Jackman <laughs> like I don't I don't know if they have that hero yet who could no who could be that foil to uh, Victor Von Doom in you know the guise of robert downey jr like that that'll be really interesting to see email from our guy kyle who uh, knows everything there's a spin-off comic called infamous iron man where doom tries to replace the void that iron man left after disappearing if they use that angle uh downey jr could be doomed trying to become a copy of tony stark there's a lot to wrap your mind yeah. around there but that's so how they much. could do it 
that's what they could yeah. do. Yeah. They, but they've already thrown out half their budget on casting. <laughs> right? So good luck. Yeah. Great to see you, man. Thanks for doing this. We'll see you back in studio next week, okay? Yeah, looking forward to it. Drew Trapton joining week. us there from his palatial new uh, office uh, over at the <laughs> Forum. We'll break. We come back. Steve Lockway will join us in studio, head football coach of the Dragons, to look ahead to 2024. We've got a bunch of other stuff we're going to talk about with head coach. We haven't seen him in a bit. He joins us in studio. Welcome back, everybody. Hot Mike rolls on on this Wednesday morning. WDOI Extra, KSFL TV in Sioux Falls, in Forum.com. Mentioned NDSU has its second spring or fall practice coming up here later today. Our next guest apparently has a couple more weeks before he has to get going. I was just brainstorming, by the way, which is always scary, that we have like specific me special intros for weekly guests. You know, we do not have one is for you. Steve Lockway. We need to change that for 2024. No, I, I'm a, I'm got... a no hashtags is maybe my <laughs> slogan. Hashtag no hashtag is my slogan. I don't know if I need Hey, you've had plenty of viral music. moments on our show. <laughs> From the Halloween candy yeah. uh, one, that, that, you got one, me, you got that me one blew up on you yeah, there. Yeah, I took the bait on that one. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Well, and then the uh, the old scorch head. Yes, that, right? that was my own doing, but that's that's been used. <laughs> we've got me a we've number got of plenty of uh, ample material. We'll have to do that. It's great well, to that's, see. That's you. why I have self deprecating humor. I just continue <laughs> to make as much. Uh, you might be the only football coach yeah. in America that pull, that, that does that, because everybody else they all got egos. Uh, it's great to see you. Congrats on uh, getting ready for a new year. How was the summer? How's the summer been? It's been great. It's yeah. been great. This is uh, definitely a bucket list item. So, you know, people <laughs> lay things out for the summer. They're like camping, hiking, sightseeing, maybe a game. Hot mic in studio with Dom Izzo. I'm like, yes, this I am checking the boxes. And so, uh, I'm pumped, right, well, it's great. I'm glad we get to do this again. Uh, you did mention, though, that your daughter was out in Eugene uh, uh, running in track town. Tell yeah. us about that. Yeah, so she ran in the Nike National Outdoor Meet. Wow. Um, um, ran the two hurdle events there and, and had a great experience. I, I've never been to track town. We've never been there. And so just the experience of running there, and, and she did real well. She she was kind of two different divisions in the, the lower division in the, in the short hurdles. She made the finals, and then, um, you know, in the other one, she was in the top division. Wow. We finished about halfway through, you know, a group the group of forty that were in that. And in her um her heat, the the winner of the heat was like the fifth fastest high school time in America that Holy year. Cow. So it was uh so it was great. It's great to be on there. And you know, you watch the little things as a coach. You look at some of the details of the branding, and then you see the warm up area, and then you see, gosh, you get pulled in like thirty minutes before and you disappear, and then all of a sudden you show up right before your your heat. And I was like, How do you stay warm? Yeah. So, well, there's an indoor track underneath the stadium where people warm up and run around. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, right. Wild experience. It is a different deal. Really there. cool. Really cool. Where do the athletic genes come from there? Not, not this, <laughs> not from this guy. <laughs> Definitely mom's side. Uh, yeah. She is an amazing athlete, though. She had a tremendous high school career. Yeah, really good with that. Um, you know, track has been been something she's worked really yeah. hard at and been fortunate to be around great coaches and great athletes. Who, Helped her do really well. She took on basketball for the first yeah. time last year as a junior. So I've been playing some one-on-one -on -one basketball this <laughs> How's summer. How's that been going? Uh, she's been working me over pretty good. <laughs> but I've managed to still stay on top. We play three-game series. Okay. Which that to, wasn't to what, 21? What are you playing? Uh, we're playing 11 by okay. ones. Okay. I got to go by two for, with the three-pointer. It gives me a little bit of an advantage <laughs> as I get tired. I got to settle for I got to just shoot a shot and hope it goes in. Um, but it, I didn't want to get beat like in one game, like by fluke, so I set up this best of three, okay. but not thinking, conditioning's not oh. my strength zone here. So, so we've had to push to the third uh, game. That's, that's you know, better your players better not be hearing this that your no, conditioning's they, not up when you got to get them ready here in the next month. <laughs> they they know my limitations. They they know me better as as well as anybody. Were you surprised that she went down track? Was, was that when she that that was one that she was going to be passionate about? Or has that always been there? No, it's. I think since she started it, she kind of liked it and liked the com com competition yeah. of it, and um, you know, got lucky that CC Debom was kind of a track athlete <laughs> right. only yeah. and kind of took her under her wing, and they trained year round, and you know, um, you know, definitely is successful. I think because of CC's success, and so that was that was great. And Rory knows what he's doing over there. <laughs> Absolutely, he's the Been man. Phenomenal program yeah. set up. Um, it's nice. I, you know, as a coach, you watch some of those things and you take some of the team building things and some of the ideas and. And you can tweak them and use them. You know, track and football, obviously, they're different. But building teams yeah. is, is not different. So it's been really good. For a football coach, 
college football division two head coach when do you have a chance to actually unplug is it Joel, like when when do you actually say okay i'm i'm taking some time away from the sport and my job end of june through july really has been kind of the most downtime that we get we we've tried to balance it out but that's really when the camps that we travel around and work at are done at the end of june we have a couple in july and so really we have we had two weeks off in july wow uh, the week the first week in August, right before we start, is off. So we've done that. So that's kind of nice. We really tried to unplug in May in a certain extent as, as far as kind of at the end of the academic year through Memorial Day, try to try to take some long weekends. I think balance is yeah. huge. And, and the more energy you have, the more excitement and passion you have every single day at work, I think that just spreads to people. And so some of that is just having a balance, and, and it's not – Grinding away until you're uh, just a shell of yourself. Yeah. You've, you've got to be the best version of yourself to get the best out of people. I got a bunch of things I want to hit on. Yeah. Some are dragon related, some aren't. Uh, with the Olympics going right now, are you have you watched? Are you do- have you dove watched into that? Watched a little bit of the uh, men's basketball. Yeah. Um, on whatever that day, some Sunday. This yeah. Sunday it was. Yep. Yeah. Uh, flag football is coming. What do you make of that? As it and I mean, I know Mike McFeely wrote about it in his column last week about the that's got support from the NFL, that this could be a sanctioned high school sport in many more states, maybe even up here in the not-too-distant future. It would be interesting. I think, um, you know, you look at it, and there's probably any way that the game could grow itself, and obviously it's a different version of the game, yep. but I think it's good. You look at basketball's got, you know, all the AAU, you got the J.O. in volleyball, you've got all these kind of extra pieces. Football hasn't had those. A seven farm system for grown, it, right? Yeah. And this has grown, and so I think, the biggest thing is if you can give kids a great experience in it. And, and that's why I say all the time to anybody that's involved in FM athletics here, just give them a great experience, get them back out the next year because that's going to build the programs and the better the high school programs, the better our programs. Just football is a great game, but you have to have a great experience doing it. In your growing up in Cavalier, which obviously is football haven, was there another sport that you were drawn to when you were younger or was it always football? I actually liked basketball the best, yeah. and that was my favorite sport growing up, probably because I could get in the gym almost whenever I wanted and, <laughs> you know, had a key for a while That's that awesome. I don't think anybody knew about <laughs> to that or the armory, and I could get in and shoot and, <laughs> and felt like, you know, basketball is kind of a game that if you can just perfect the shot, it should go in every time, right? In and theory, so, yeah. Right, and so you're just like, okay, I, I can be in control to make this happen. You don't need a bunch of guys necessarily to get to get – to get together to, to to work on it and be better and, and certainly it's not as physical and demanding as practicing football and so um i tried to find pickup games wherever i could when did you uh when did the basketball dream go aside and football was the way to go down how old well were you i knew i wanted to coach football yeah. i like the uh the strategy of 11 on 11 it was kind of the tactics that, that drew me to that i think coach oxenow was a phenomenal coach and and kind of inspired me to want to do that uh coming out of cavalier i think when there was some attention recruiting wise for football and <laughs> and basketball didn't have the same uh, attention intensity I think it, for that yeah, yeah i think it became kind of <laughs> obvious if i want to be a college athlete and i want to be a coach um football was the avenue to go and so uh, i still will hold the claim to fame that tim miles did recruit me as a basketball player i don't think i do that yeah he did he was at mayville state at the time and he told me i'd be a heck of an eighth man coming <laughs> off the bench so i was like Hey, he shot me straight. And oh, that's awesome. Pretty good evaluator of talent, I would say. He, he knows what he's yeah, talking exactly. about. So, yeah. I mean, that's my claim to fame in the basketball. The world. amount of people that are interconnected around here dev- never ceases to amaze me. That's hysterical. I did not know I that. got really lucky that, you know, had the interactions with him when he was at NDSU. You think about yeah. just paying attention as a young coach to how he's conducting himself in front of alumni uh, with the media. Yep. You've got Bucky Mon was there. Casey Bradley at the time, and you're yep. just taking all these things in and soaking them in, and it was it was a phenomenal uh, learning experience I got to be a part of. Uh, before we go to break, we had a story on yesterday that uh, your program is selling old jerseys. Is there a way I could get one of? How do we get one of those framed here? Can we we make that happen? How, I when, think we could figure out how to make that. How happen. did this uh, call come about? Give us the lowdown on it. Well, it's just you know you look in in. Finances are always important, yep. and, and, and it's a difficult time, uh, especially with the travel. The travel becomes expensive, and the Kendry trip. And we were at the point where uh, my mom and uh, Abe Rorick's wife's grandma couldn't keep uh, couldn't keep fixing the jerseys. We're out of material <laughs> to keep sewing them together, and so we got to the point we needed to buy new ones. And, and this was a way to kind of recoup some of the money. Okay. And so, um, give some guys an opportunity to be able to have some memorabilia, some parents to be able to have some pride in the 
in the stands with it. I can so. tell you, like a Damon Gibson jersey, that'd be worth something, right? I think I so. I would think that'd be all right. We'll see. Huh? I don't know if it's still available. <laughs> it was a, a third of them went, like, within a day or two. So. Is that right? Holy yeah, cow. Yeah, so there's only two-thirds left. So. All right, so the nerd in me will ask you, Are you, is there a new look to the jerseys, or is it the same which you've had that you're going to debut? We're in? moved to Under Armour. Okay. And so there'll be a there will be a new look. Nice. Um, It'll be a new look. Can't tell me anything else, huh? Well, I think the, <laughs> the plan is opening night to be to okay. go all black. So Ooh, it'll be blackout on, really? blackout on Thursday so night. So black helmets? So, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different fundraiser. <laughs> One at a time here. <laughs> Unless we've got a donor that well, wants to hey, buy all you're new on, black you're helmets. On the air so here. there we go. We That's got Dragon a, alums if, all over the we place. we want to make so that happen. We got, we, we we got, got Dragon alums yeah. that listen and watch all the time. Here so let's go. So all black. All right. I like that. It'll be... That'll be a great debut. That Thursday night deal, which I'll get to in a bit, that's been a sweet spot for you guys. I know it's, the results have been a little mixed sometimes, sure. but I, I think that's always – it's been a neat way to, to kind of catapult into your season, to get some energy going on that Thursday uh, when people are around. Without you know? a doubt. We're excited. All right, let's break. We'll come back. A couple more uh, – you got a time for a couple more segments, right? You're not doing anything. You're not practicing oh, yet. This is so, my right? bucket list summer <laughs> item. I got the whole day. We can stay oh, wow. Here. That's, oh, here you go. We'll break. Come back. Wrap up our first hour. Back with Steve Lockway here in studio. Head coach of the Dragons right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Wrapping up our first hour. Steve Lockway, head coach of the Minnesota State University Morehead Dragon football team in studio. Got an email in to ask you about... Uh, is it true that the regionality is gone in Division II postseason? Uh, we've heard that 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 looks like it's actually they're going to try and get rid of it, right? Is that do we understand that correctly? I think they're working towards Kay. it. Kind of, I don't means I don't know exactly how that's going to look, but I think it's on the docket in twenty five um, to kind of Amen. work that a little bit. We'll see how it goes. Because um, the Northern Sun gets hammered in that you and i have discussed this time and time again um and i talked with chad walthall and tim bergstrass many times and carla as well that it's just the northern sun just continually when you're playing each other early in the i mean it just it sucks there's no, no way I, to put it i think it's a great idea hopefully it can it can happen i think obviously there's some there's some question marks with the NCA and where is that going? And then, you know, if you get rid of that, the finances become Ex- astronomically no high. No okay, well, where is that money going? Yep. And so then you start looking at, well, is there a departure of the Power Four now? Well, that takes money out of the NCA. And so if the money's gone out of the NCA, right. how is that going to happen? And so you want to move that way, but depending on how the, the economics of it work, it could swing further the other way yep. and, and resemble a lot more like Division Three. You know, yeah. And they're expanding their postseason. I saw. Is there any movement there for there, D2? There is a little bit of that. Yep. So I think um, I think we have a good shot. We'll see how that plays out. What are you guys at right now? Thirty-two. Yes. To go to, I wonder, how, like to no. forty-eight. I'm curious how many more you got to go no, to. We're twenty-eight. To okay, move twenty-eight. To Thirty-two. Okay. Because every the first round buys. So okay. The regions. Well, that could be better for the Northern Sun as well, considering yeah. how difficult a league it is that. Sometimes the league only gets two, potentially three, that there might be a spot open up there for a, a fourth-place team to potentially get in. Yeah, hopefully. And so with the non-conference schedule, that kind of opens up maybe some to make the case right. a little bit better than we've had in the past. The All the logistical things that are happening around the NCA with football, how much do you keep an eye on it? Or is it, so, you know what, unless it directly concerns me and, and my team, I'm I'm not really worried about it. I don't dive into it too much. I try and just keep my ears open to see kind of what's going on. But at the end of the day, a lot of that doesn't affect us. You know, that's it's at a level so much higher yeah. than us. Um, those the collectives and the NILs, you know, those things don't don't affect us. Um, but the kind of the general landscape of okay, is there going to be a departure of some of the bigger schools yep. out of the NCA and then the NCA reshuffles? Okay, what would that look like? But at the end of the day. It's us just kind of getting rules handed down to us that come from Division One that probably don't apply to us, and then you're kind of like, oh, okay, well, whatever. There's <laughs> another rule that doesn't really affect, or removal of the rule. Yeah. Like, well, whatever. That didn't really affect us either. So <laughs> it's kind of a crazy deal. Recruiting wise, has that changed in terms of how much you can be on the road and and how much uh, you can have official visits on campus? Has that affected you in the Division Two world? It hasn't yet, okay. but I think as Right, as kind of they're removing the restrictions because restrictions keep people from the possibility of earning money for NIL. So then you start removing those. So now you're 
it's getting to the point where there's few, going to be fewer and fewer rules, and so I think <laughs> that's on the docket where that definitely could happen, and there's no, I know the talk is there's no recruiting calendar. So it's like, right. hey, you can just go kind of go out whenever, as much as you want, whenever you want, um, you know, good or bad. I don't know. It, it opens the gap between haves and have-nots a little bit, but it also – Makes some sense. Too. You and I discussed this, this last question before we break, and we're going to talk about your actual football team in the next segment. On the Division One early signing period, it's been moved up two weeks. And you and I have talked about this because yours has not moved. It's still that first Wednesday in February. Is that a good thing for you guys now that you know two weeks ahead of time of who you're looking at or who you can go get? I think it, in general, it's been good. So the new, the two signing days has been good. It clears up. Division One is clearing up so fast that. We're so far ahead of the game yeah. compared to what we've been. So I think that's been good. There is talk that we'll get to add a December signing day, which I think would be important because I think last year by the time we got to December, we had over half of our class was already committed. By the end of December, it was over 80%. You're just so you'd have but most you're of waiting your, until February right. to sign. So, so you'd, you'd have like most of your that. guys locked in by Christmas time. Absolutely. Okay. And I think the the great thing is you look and go, it probably is a, for us in Division Two. that's a great budget savings if guys are – they're maybe not having to come in on on official visits. They've done that work through the summer on unofficials and camps and whatever it might be, and so you got a chance to save money and save travel. And so I think those are things that are the real concerns about Division Two, yeah. which is completely opposite of Division no doubt. One, the, the money parameters. And that's the thing for, and I'm not just saying this because you're here, but for Division Two coaches to sweat it out when a Division One guy maybe doesn't get the offer or signs with a school, and then it's a guy maybe you're looking at, but you still have to wait six weeks to try and, and maybe you sign him, and then he wants to bolt because he gets a preferred walk-on somewhere. I don't know how many times you and I have probably talked that, well, we had this guy, and then he got something else, and now he's gone. That's probably happened too many times to count. Right? Yeah, and it's in, in today's world, you almost have to – got to be prepared for that. It can happen. It's you know yeah. the portal. That can happen at any point in right. time. So you're trying to plan – Four years, five years in advance, but in reality, like we got to make sure that we've got a beat on this year after year, semester after semester, almost to make sure that you're in a place where your roster is able to build enough talent and depth to to handle any sort of crazy things that happen that way. Let's break. We come back much more with Steve. We'll actually talk about the 2024 Dragons, expectation wise, and some good coaching stories as well. We're back on Hot Mike on this Wednesday morning. Right after this. This is Hot Mike. Hot Mike. On the networks of WDAY. WDAY. Here's Dom Izzo. We're welcome back, everybody. We're being joined by MSU and head football coach Steve Lockway. The Dragons open up fall camp. What is it, August? I'm getting in the spot. 11th? When are you going back? 11th? When do you got to go back week, to work? A week from, when's week your from wife, Monday. When's your wife kicking you out of the house? Week go back from to Monday. work. Yeah, week from Monday. <laughs> I got limited time to get this uh, to-do project list done. So, so in the old days, you used to have two-a-days when you were a player and certainly a, early on as a coach. So how different is it now for fall camp where you you have a – two-hour window to try and get as much in as you can. How difficult is that compared to, hey, we're going to go from 9 to 11, then we'll see you back here at 3 o'clock? Uh, it's it's difficult. It's been good. I think the, the challenge is weird. Like the first week, you've after every physical activity, you have to have three hours off that you can't have meetings, you can't have these things. You're so like the day becomes so long when you're trying to get a walk through, a lift, a practice, practice and you're in. trying to put yep. the hours in between before you then can get to a meeting <laughs> and you know to watch film yep. to install to do some team building things and so that that first week the days get really long to be honest they're not as physical obviously as they used to be um but i think we've gotten a good rhythm last year i think we felt a good rhythm in fall camp and so we'll build off of that again this year i think i um, there's a palpable excitement around your football team after last year of winning seven games with Jack Strand back at quarterback, who was the NSIC Offensive Player of the Year. How do you build off of that for 2024? With, you know, expectations are the Dragons, they, people think they're going to be, you guys are going to be pretty good this upcoming fall. Yeah, I think last year we probably caught some people off guard. We didn't come off a great season, and so people maybe didn't expect a lot, and maybe maybe people on inside the rooms of our building didn't expect a, a lot. And so, um, you know, this year I think it's different. Their expectations, we knew that was going to be the case. And so we started that in our off-season development of, hey, what are some things that are going to be different, some challenges we're going to have to, to take on. And one of them is going to be expectations. So how are we going to handle expectations as a team, um, as individuals? And, you know, and sat down and Jack and have a conversation about, hey, you understand that everyone probably expects you to be 
the offensive player of the year again. again. Everyone expects you to be second in the conference or, or in the nation in passing. You know why? Because something you did last year that doesn't have any bearing on this yeah. year. So how are we going to handle those? What is what are healthy expectations and how can we not let those be like kind of a burden on our shoulders? For Jack Strand, what do you see from him? What do you need to see from him to take another step forward in 2024? Well, I think the judge of all great players and, and great leaders is how good can you make the people around you? And so um, certainly he can do that by throwing the football around and distributing it and, and, and doing those things. But how can he do it not maybe with his arm? You know, how can he do it inspiring guys, teaching guys, mentoring guys, you know, coaching? We, we talk a lot about coaching the human spirit. Like those are... Those are the things that, that we need to be great at collectively as a coaching staff, as players, as leaders. You know, there's those moments when, when you see guys and, and they need you, right? It's yeah. maybe after a drop pass, their their body language is down. And so when their eyes come up and they, they look to Jack Strand, is Jack Strand going to be there and reaffirm them and, and pick them up and, and say, you know, we got you the next time? Or are they going to look up and see Jack Strand with poor body language and hanging his head or shaking his head like, I can't believe you dropped that? Well, that's not going to make you very good for the next no. next rep, and so those are those are the things we've been talking about and really trying to coach well. Gage Florence has been a national phenomenon the last couple of years. Uh, your wide receiver from Velva, how does he? Where does he go? Does it all depend on Strand getting him the football? Right. Well, sure. You know, it's <laughs> kind of like it's kind of like a post player in basketball. Yeah. You can't you can't affect the game unless you get the ball. Get the and ball. so obviously he has to do those things. I mean, 200, 208 catches in ridiculous, his first man. two years is is wild. <laughs> But we talked to Gage a little bit about, hey, what if your stat line at the end of the season looks like this? It's not two, it's not 108 catches. It's 83, but instead of 950 yards, it's 1,200 yards. And and would that help us? And and how can you handle that? And hey, Gage, what if we're we're playing in a game and now all of a sudden you're catching six to seven yeah. balls in a game? And you know now there's people in your ear going, oh, what's wrong? You only got seven catches. Like are are you not playing well? Or do they not? You know, how are you going to handle, handle those that. things? And so we've tried to address all those things that, that may come up before the moment. So when the moment gets here, we're ready to handle it. That's tough for, you know, 20 year old. You have, you've been lauded, you've had interviews, you've had your name out there, you got videos and then, well, if I'm not getting the ball as much, you know, that that's a, that's a mental gymnastics hurdle. You got to overcome, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's why, you know, we tried to address it before the fact instead yeah. of getting into it. And I think trying to put the right frame of, of reference around okay what does that actually mean and how can I, how can that be successful and what is success and and what is being a great teammate and what's a great season look like and so uh, we've tried to craft some of those out for our guys and hopefully you know when the rubber hits the road we're able to do that when the heat's on I know everything is always flashy on offense but I thought defensively wise is why you won seven games tell me about that side of the ball what excites you a couple of players that excite you about 2024 well I think just phenomenal coaching with with the, the defensive coaching staff they've built a, a system that fits the players that we have um and and their willingness to play for each other to to give themselves up we you know if you look a lot of times we walk out there we probably don't have all the one-on-one matchups you know checked in our favor yeah. and, and most times we don't have very many of them in our favor but I think our our guys are willing to to maybe take a two for one, you know, give yourself up, take two, and you allow another guy. And so we've avoided one on one matchups. We've tried to get it to two on one. And so they play within the scheme great. Guys are willing to to be able to do that. You know, Josiah Bam coming back as an all conference player has been a captain for two years. That's that's uh, huge great, for you there. Great right? leadership yeah. for us. He's done a phenomenal job with that. I think Denver Sheets and Justice Noel are ready to take off on the D line after Baby's kid. Aiden yep. Carr, you know, graduated yep. as a captain, moved on. Those guys are ready. I think Tate Gustafson. His move from safety to linebacker, you know, two springs ago, and then by the end of the year, he really got in a flow where you felt like this guy's playing at an all-conference level. So I think that's great. You know, DBs I think are going to be some question marks. You lose Jake Betcher, you lose Jared Collenbach, um, but you got some guys back. Mikhail Pearson from DGF played phenomenal. He's a good player. Yeah. He's a good high school player. You know, so we need to have him continue yeah. to step up. Cody Sorensen, we lost uh, to a season-ending injury. You know week three or week four so having him back, back would be great yep. and so uh, hopefully we can get adam collenbach healthy and so we've got some things we can build on back there it's a I, great it's a great unit i don't know if you know this but your league is pretty good <laughs> and uh your schedule did you know favors this year because uh you're playing all the all the big boys you go you're playing at duluth augie comes here i gotta i'll call up uh over there because i gotta <laughs> who scheduled mankato for homecoming what's that <laughs> 
That's a, that's a tough draw. What are we doing, Humphrey. right? <laughs> well, it seems like my thoughts are coming out on the mic through your <laughs> Go voice. For so it, that's, man. that's crazy. If my thoughts are coming out of your mouth on the on the mic, it's yeah. It's sometimes oh. you know the one year we played uh, Mankato. I think they were ranked number I one remember. at the time for homecoming, and I just thought uh, somebody on the committee hates me. I don't know what I've done. But, hey, you know what? At, at the end of the day, that's some of it's the dates. It plays out. There'll be a good crowd there. I mean, it was a great game last year. Shoot, we yeah, played in you, Mankato. You should have won that one. Huh? And it was it was the top five. I can't remember yeah. what exactly of all time game. attendance in their stadium. Yep. And so I'm, um, you know, it was a big crowd, and so it's probably good. We got a good crowd, you know, for for that game. Hopefully, we can play <laughs> play good football. It's a long time till we get to that point. So, open up with a Thursday night game, as we mentioned, off with Wayne State. Describe that and the thought process on do you've done this now? Gosh, I want to say seven, eight years. At least every other year when you can do it, you've done the Thursday night game. Yeah, I love the Thursday night game. I think some is it it shortens fall camp a little. Yep. That can get long and monotonous. And so I think we've got a, a good schedule that leads us into being pretty healthy and fresh for that Thursday game. I also like that it gives you a little bit of downtime, you know, a Saturday off before you get to the next week. Yeah. And with Duluth on the road, that's two big games back to back. And so having a little bit more prep time there is definitely helpful. I think this year doesn't play out as well. Usually it's Thursday before Labor Day. Right. This is Thursday after, after Labor, Labor Day. Day. Yeah. So that's maybe not quite as, as great. But I'll tell you, as a football coach, to have that one Saturday off when you play Thursday, it's, right? it's kind of nice. to. And I won't say it's off because we practice and we have meetings. But you come home and you're like, wow, there's a football game on. And I can actually <laughs> watch this thing or, you know, and, or not just yeah. be wiped out from Correct. a whole day of a game decision making. You're just like, oh. So uh, I, I like having kind of a weekend of a little bit of balance before it gets really crazy. I'm getting Marcus in on here. We're going to figure out how in the world they put Mankato on homecoming. So <laughs> hey, it, it, was be... the, it was, by the way, Eric tells me it was the third uh, largest crowd ever yeah. last year. It for was, your a, game at it was a big crowd and it was, it was a great game. And is Blakesley changed from when you played at NDSU? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it sure didn't seem. No, like, it doesn't it had, seem that's like why it. the Vikings yeah, left. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the definitely the places, the changing room and those things are different around yeah. there where the basketball stadium is. But, you know, the I, football stadium itself is the same. Yeah, it's not great <laughs> memories for me there. In my senior year, we missed a field goal at the end in 2001 <laughs> in a team where we probably should have made the playoffs mm. and made the semifinals the year before. It was kind of a whole debacle. That whole trip. <laughs> oh, here we go. I'm so. ripping the Band-Aid off. No, it's okay. I've moved on. Can't you tell? <laughs> I so can it's sense it. There. It's like I've moved on over these things. A couple other questions Just like I the have. semifinal I, I, loss. I was going to say. Yeah. My high, in high school, <laughs> senior year, we're in the semifinals, overtime loss. Yeah, I've moved on from those. It's not a big deal. Football losses just stick with people, right? Though that's sure it. Do they do? But like you remember those probably more. Look at they're, some you're of more them. probably than the wins you have. Some right? of them, but no, I, I remember some wins too. <laughs> those are they balance out. The expectation angle that we talked about, like in your own mind, what is it going to be if it to be successful? Obviously, playoffs is conference champ. All that is there. But for you, in your own mind, what do we need to do to be successful and feel like we had a good year? Yep. We, we've got to play together as a team, be selfless, inspire each other, support each other, be there for each other, make football the best part of everybody's day. And so we understand we're leaving on this journey. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be adversity. There's going to be pressure. And we've got a group of guys that we've got to forge together and solidify as one single unit and heartbeat to handle all those stresses and pressure and adversity. And if we can do that well together and go through it, we'll, we'll, we'll ride that roller coaster. And when we're done, We'll be, we'll be a group. We'll be stronger together. We'll be beat up. The shine will be knocked off. We'll have guys that will be injured in crutches at the end of this thing. But if we do it together, um, you know, we'll be happy with how it plays out. And I think that's where our strength is. If we can do it together, then w the wins will take care of themselves. How early in the fall camp will you lose your voice? Oh, probably week three. <laughs> you know? Although my four-year-old's been on a tear here the last couple oh. of weeks, so I've had to practice the yelling voice. So it's... So it's it's good training, I guess. That's that's what I'm telling myself. All right, before we go, I was digging through the WDAY archives for some classic Steve Lockway uh, coaching video, and oh. I, I I couldn't find playing. I didn't have that much time. We got to go. I got to go into the basement to find that. But uh, I dug up some from both NDSU and then from Shanley. Look at this. Look Boy. at this guy. Jeez. Look at how young you look, huh? Not as much gray hair there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm talking standing next to right? Steve, Steve Walker. Walker what right standing there. next to Steve Walker uh -huh. for? I must have been lost. Do you lost. remember this? Yeah, I, 
I came in right after Todd Wash gave a great uh, press <laughs> conference, and then I had to say something. I was like, what am I standing up here And then for? there you are with the late, yeah. great Randy Nelson Randy uh, awesome. when you're getting introduced as the head football coach. I remember I was there that day. How nervous were you for this? I was nervous. I was like, why is everybody here? This isn't that big of a deal. These guys haven't won a game in three years. I, right? <laughs> Who yeah. cares that I'm coaching there? So that, that was, was 2007 that you got that hired was... uh, at Shanley. And look at that. There's so, And by the way, you guys were playing – Everywhere, like your for that year, you played at Concordia, if I remember we right, right? At Concordia, the Dome, Fargo South. We were all over the place. I almost threw up before the first game. There's <laughs> only been two games as a coach I've almost thrown up beforehand. That was the first one there. Two thousand seven. Like, yeah, the first game that we played against Minot, I was like, oh my gosh, well this is gonna. I can't believe I'm we're gonna about to do this. Look so. at you there. Wow, yeah, I got a lot more hair. I didn't realize how much I was thinning. The hair but was that, thinning. This is at Concordia. Yeah. And, that's that was the that was the only win we got that season. <laughs> they they tried to hit me with the Gatorade after the game and they missed. I was like, you guys are terrible at everything. <laughs> I mean, who? That was probably oh. we were like one and eight oh that season. Gosh. It was like game seven, game eight, towards the end of the year, and we win. And like they're dousing me with the water cooler. I was like, I'm probably the only one in seven coach to ever get doused <laughs> with water. It was that was your first win. It was yeah, it was, oh, it was wild. I. Was, I <laughs> I remember that because they missed, and I was just like, wow, this is not how I envisioned that ever going. Good. Okay, so what was the second game you almost threw up? You mentioned uh, the game the second, one. Second uh, championship at Shanley before okay. the state championship. At we the had, Alaris Center, yeah. Yes, we had okay. averaged 50 points a game, darn near won every game by about 30 points Hell on of a average. game with Grafton then, that year. And then we got to the end and was just like, well, it kind of felt like if we don't win it, the whole thing is just kind of a – you know, a whole season of greatness yeah. is just yeah. gone. And so it's a lot there. That was I felt that one. So that's some good stuff. The only times I felt like throwing up at, at Moritz, it's just been the play's been bad. <laughs> it's not been the nervous. You know, those first few years, I was like, oh gosh, this is, looks terrible. This might make me throw up. So. That, that's my last question before we go. Because you've done this now. This is what, year 14? 15? That sounds right. Since that yeah. you, you, is this is this longer than you thought? Had you thought you'd go somewhere else? Or is this, you know what, this is where I my home, and I wanted to, you've built this into a program where people respect it and know it. Has it exceeded what you thought you were going to do here? I think going back through the journey, it was something that wasn't like, hey, it's stepping stone and moving around. It's like my journey kind of took me in this route. I'm a Fargo, Moorhead, North Dakota, Minnesota guy. And so that part's been good. This, yeah. is, this is home. I love being here. I love, you know, having a program for the people of this area with the players of this area. And I think just doing it our way and doing it the right way. Um, we've certainly grown a long way from where we are. No doubt. Certainly, I think we've got bigger hopes to to be able to make it bigger and better. And there's challenges that come with that. And we got to continue to keep knocking those obstacles away and, and be able to do that. And so I've loved it. I think there's a lot of passionate people that are have been involved with the program on, on kind of the inside and on the outside. And continue to be proud of what we're building. I constantly run into Dragon football fans that just are excited about what's going on. I, whenever I go speak at MAA, that you you get those questions all the time. There's passion there for where things were, which was not good, to where you got now where there's respectability, accountability, and re- logistic or lo- logical expectations for your program that weren't there when you started. It just it wasn't, it wasn't there. No, it's been great. Um, you know, obviously we've got ways to go, but – you just look at it, and, and I think, you know, I, I explained it. We're, we're kind of like the hole-in-the-wall restaurant, right, that doesn't maybe look so good from the outside, but you go in there, and you're like, wow, this is really good, and there's really something special here. And you walk in, and people kind of like cheers, like, hey, Norm, how are you? it's great to have you here. And you and know, and I think there really is something special about it. And so, you know, I'd encourage people that haven't taken a look just, to, just to get close enough to the program to – to take a look at it, see what it's really about, and there, there, there's something special that we do there. All right, we're left with two things i got to bug Marcus in about. A, who's scheduling Mankato on homecoming? B, black helmets, right? Anything else you want me to, to, to get them uh, on? No, the I like here? that. If you can make those we'll things make it happen, happen. That's, uh, <laughs> you're, you're, so are you my agent now? Like, well, if, well no, if, if, I'm if not this, going that if well, this You want to pay. <laughs> What's, what hey, am I getting? Well, let's work out. <laughs> if this can work, I think then you become the agent. The next contract, you go in. Let's figure oh, all out. Right. A, let's figure out a percentage here. Well, let's do some negotiating here on the air. Can we count on you coming back on Tuesdays this coming fall? Is that a... without a doubt? It's all right. one of the best parts of my week. All I, right, I love this time. I appreciate being in here. I just you do a phenomenal job with the sports around this area. And I appreciate people are that. Engaged and. Sports are an awesome way to bring people together, and, and you're part of that. And so it's, um, I'm glad that I get to be a part of it for 
Saturdays and then Tuesdays in Absolutely. here. So hopefully we can keep doing Let's that. Let's do it. Let's bring some joy to some All people's right. lives. From the Cavalier, North Dakota, Steve Lockway joining us here. Great to see you. Thanks so much for making some time for us this morning. Good luck this year, and we'll see you on Tuesdays. All right? Thanks. Appreciate it. Steve Lockway, head coach of the Dragons in studio. We'll come back. We'll put a finishing touches on Hot Mike. we got Bison Media Zone coming up. We'll wrap things up right after this. All right, wrapping things up. That was fun. Our thanks to Steve Lockway for coming in studio, giving up uh, a bit of his morning here. I know some will roll their eyes. What are you talking about the Dragons for? No one cares about Division II football. I would object to that. I know uh, a large swath of our listening and viewing audience cares about Division II football, and especially with the amount of local guys that Steve has on his team, his standout wide receivers from Belva. Uh, a couple of his standout defensive players, one's from Fargo, one's from uh, Dilworth. So there's plenty of local connection there as well, and uh, and they're good. They won seven games last year. I expect them to win uh, that many this year. They got a heck of a quarterback that was the offensive player of the year in the Northern Sun a season ago. Uh, there's ample reason enough why, and uh, he's always good enough to come on and give us a few minutes. We appreciate uh, Steve coming on today, and we'll uh, restart those uh, weekly Tuesday segments as we get closer to the start of the 2024 season. Uh, the hits just keep on coming for the old Minnesota Twins. Uh, email came in when we were visiting with Steve that uh, the Twins have placed Brock Stewart back on the injured list. They just got him back. Last week, I think he struck out Bryce Harper in a big spot, and uh, now he's on the injured list again. So uh, this is a great tweet from uh, from Betsy Helflin, who covers the Twins as well. This is to sum up what's going on here pitching-wise. The Twins traded for Trevor Richards. Josh Stallmont was designated for assignment. Randy Dobnak had his contract purchased in his uniform against the Mets. We may even see him uh, today. And Alex Karloff was moved to the 60-day IL. And now Brock Stewart is going on the injured list. Uh, so the official email says it's right shoulder tendonitis for Stewart, who was just reinstated from the 60-day injury list a week ago today. And now uh, he's back on there. Taking the 26-man roster spot vacated by Stewart will be right at a pitcher, Trevor Richards, who was acquired in a trade with the Toronto Blue Jays yesterday. Richards will be in uniform for today's game against the Mets and wear jersey number 32. So there you have it. They need a win today. For it's an off day and the 16-game uh, losing streak White Sox come to town uh, for Joe Maurer uh, celebration night on Saturday at Target Field. Uh, real quick before we get to what to watch, uh, update the Olympic medal count. we got a big day today in the pool and, uh, and gymnastics as well after what happened yesterday. You saw the USA uh, women's gymnastics team took the team title for the gold medal. So the U.S. still... Out in front with 27 overall. They have four golds. France, the home nation, with six gold medals, 21 total. Great Britain with 17. The Brits won the four-by-two relay yesterday in the pool. China comes in fourth with eight gold medals. And Japan in fifth with 13 overall medals. We're just a couple days away from the track portion beginning. That starts on Friday. I expect the U.S. to clean up there. They traditionally do on the track. The pool, it's been between them and the Australians and a few nights left of swimming. They have three more nights, counting tonight, of swimming before uh, things wrap up there. So that's the updated medal count going on at the Olympics. Let's do some what to watch before we get out of here. All right, so we got the finale at City Field today. Twins and the Mets. Pablo Lopez throwing for uh, the Twins today. He'll be going against Luis Severino for New York noon on Bally Sports North. This will be the last game in the blackout stage for you Twins fans on Midco. If you got the enhanced package, of course. We'll get back to that uh, on the show on Friday. The United States men's basketball team plays its second preliminary game against the South Sudanese. South Sudan, 145 today on USA. Of course, that's the team that nearly beat the Americans uh, in the exhibition, the USA had to win by one on a late LeBron James basket. That's coming up today. And for the first time in the history of this show, we are telling you about a sporting event on the E! Television Network. 
that's owned by NBC and Comcast. They have the USA women's soccer team playing in its final round robin game against Australia. They're good. That's at noon on E. I don't know what channel E is, but it's on there if you were looking for it. Our thanks to Drew Trafton and Steve Lockway for stopping by for today's show. If you missed any of it, you can podcast it later today at Inforum.com. The Bison Media Zone on tap to preview the new season. We're back on Hot Mike tomorrow, live from Bison Media Day. See you tomorrow, everybody.